Hi guys, I'm Stephanie Adam. I am one of the foot and ankle orthopedists for Summit Medical Group. I'm over in Florham Park. We have a pretty heavy uh, sports practice. We are consultants for the Devils and the Red Bulls soccer team. This is a little bit about myself, my uh, background. I did my fellowship in foot and ankle at Hospital for Special Surgery. My topic will be a traumatic uh, tendon disorders. We'll cover uh, plantar fasciitis, posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, and Achilles tendinopathy. Just some fun facts. Um, there's 26 bones in the foot. There's 33 joints. So it tends to be a little bit of a complex situation, which always helps when you have a foot and ankle uh, background training. So the first topic is plantar fasciitis. The plantar fascia is the tissue at the bottom of the foot. It connects from the heel into the metatarsals. It maintains the support, stabilizing the joints of the foot. Plantar fasciitis is extremely common. It's one of the most common uh, causes for uh, visits. It accounted for about a million visits per year uh, annually. It's just the local inflammation and degeneration of the proximal plantar fascia. The patient will come in with pain and tenderness on the heel. It'll be most commonly with weight bearing. They'll also complain of morning pain and stiffness. <clears throat> What causes plantar fasciitis? So that is a multifactorial problem. Typically, it'll be associated with prolonged uh, weight-bearing activities, improper shoe wear with minimal arch support, obesity, increased age, inflammatory arthropathies, and there's a very strong association with gastrocnemius tightness with plantar fasciitis. If you look at the diagram to the right, it shows that in a study there was 57% of the patients with plantar fasciitis had an isolated gastrocnemius contracture. That helps with treatment as you move forward. Biggest question a patient comes in, they say, okay, I have pain. It hurts every time I stand up. It hurts worse in the morning. You take an x-ray. X-rays are very important in this situation. Every once in a while, you can have somebody with like a calcaneal stress fracture. They'll have a you know, bone cyst. They could have you know, some other findings. So the, the x-rays are important. Patients get very hung up with the fact of having a heel spur. A lot of patients will have a heel spur on x-ray and they say, oh, the spur is my problem. Spur doesn't correlate by size or with the symptoms. There's various morphologies to the plantar spur. It just means that the symptoms have been brewing over time, essentially. The tightness in the plantar fascia has been occurring and over time then it finally develops into true plantar fasciitis. Treatment. So the biggest treatment um, has to be a conglomerate and, and is very non-operative. So it can start with you guys. The most important in the beginning is really keeping with a nice soft heel cup, which is made of silicone. He orthotics are helpful because they maintain the arch, but sometimes they're too hard, so they can hurt the person's heel. Anti-inflammatories and ice helps a significant amount. Probably number one and most important is plantar fascia and Achilles stretching. The diagram, the pictures to the right, uh, demonstrate probably two of the most important stretches. This was studied uh, by, a, by a female orthopedist and showing like 95% of these symptoms improved with just these two stretches. Physical therapy can be very helpful. The stretches have to be a habit. They have to be every time the patient has pain. They can't walk through the pain. They'll commonly say, oh, if I walk through it, it goes away. But that starts the cycle of the chronicity of the plantar fasciitis. A night splint's also important. It will help with the morning symptoms and the stiffness, so you're off to a good start first thing in the morning. So the problem is, what if that doesn't work? There's a small percentage of patients that go on to still have persistent symptoms. The second line of treatment brings you into cortisone. Cortisone is used pretty liberally sometimes uh, by our, our uh, podiatrists in the community as a first line, and they'll do three repetitive uh, cortisone injections into the plantar fascia. It will take care of the symptoms. It has the risk of tearing the tissue, and it also hasn't really taken care of the trouble, which is the problem with the calf and the tightness in the plantar fascia. An option from there is platelet-rich plasma, which uh, gives you high levels of platelets, which secrete cytokines and growth factors, which kind of help with the healing process. The troubles are a lot of the studies are somewhat equivocal, some showing improvement. There's definitely has not been one negative study. Um, it is not covered by insurance, unfortunately, so a lot of times that's a deterrent to patients. Similarly with shockwave. Shockwave is a safe alternative to proceeding with any surgical intervention, 
um, but the same thing, similar with the equivocal study, some positive, some negative, good outcomes, but, but nothing showing 100%, so a lot of times the insurance companies don't cover that one either. So then you say, okay, you know, when does a patient need surgery? When do I send them on? You know, so on and so forth. And it is typically failure of non-operative treatment. And the treatment of uh, the gold standard treatment is doing a release of the plantar fascia. The trouble is that is approximately a 50% failure. A lot of times patients still have symptoms after a plantar fascia release. It's really not the best procedure. It has a long recovery time, has a high rate of complications and can alter the foot biomechanics. Typically, um, a gastroc recession is a good option given the fact that the source of the trouble tends to be with the gastroc uh, muscle. And so a gastroc recession is releasing the calf fascia so that it has less tightness. So you're taking care of the source of the problem instead of taking care of uh, some of the symptoms. So our next topic is posterior tibial dysfunction. And people also kind of, uh, when they come to you, they'll say, I have a flat foot, my arch has fallen, similar symptoms, you know, or, or descriptions like that. So posterior tibial tendon dysfunction refers to the varying amount of pathology with the posterior tibial tendon. It could be a flexible or a fixed deformity of the subtalar and transverse tarsal joints. The posterior tibial tendon is one of the strongest tendons on the inside of the ankle. It supports the arch and allows you to go up on your toes. Posterior tibial tendon dysfunction goes in um, stages. So stage one just starts with pain and swelling inside the ankle. There's no significant deformity to the foot or arch. X-rays are very helpful for that, for that um, diagnosis and uh, even comparing to the contralateral side. Weight-bearing x-rays are the most important, as well as on physical exam, weight-bearing the patient to see if they have deformity. Typically, they'll complain of foot weakness. They'll feel like the foot flops a little bit because they can't go on their toes from heel toe as well, and they have some difficulty walking. Patients don't come running for this problem. They'll come in late, essentially, and as the tendon uh, continues to get more and more inflammation, they'll start developing deformity, and their arches will start to fall. So they'll have progressive valgus deformity of the foot. You'll notice when they stand up, you'll have kind of a flattening of the arch. I'll show you some pictures of that. And they'll still have kind of that inside swelling. That puts them in stage two of posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. And then as it advances, it goes on to becoming a stiff flat foot. So the foot is now flat and it doesn't come in and outwards. So they develop ankle, or they develop subtalar arthritis which is below the ankle. And they start changing their symptoms. They start developing pain on the outer portion of their foot instead of on the tendon. So the question always is, you know, who am I looking for? Where, where should I be kind of paying attention? So the person comes in, they have pain swelling on the inside of the ankle. They're typically women. Um, it's not usually related to an injury. You'll have them stand. The foot will kind of look a little flat on the other side. And they're usually around 50s or 60s. This is what they look like. So their, their arch will be kind of subtly flattened. You can see the swelling on the inside of the ankle. And when you look at them from the back, you'll see kind of the, the foot going into a bit of a valgus on the left. And you can start to see the toes on the outer border of the foot. Too many toe signs, they call it. We don't truly know what causes it, but it is a combination of mechanical prop, uh, properties, wear and tear on, the, on an already flat foot. We found it related to be uh, hormonal and biologic properties, and then it causes weakening of the tendon and then finally tearing. The x-rays are, are most important because you can watch the deformity over time. MRIs are important, but not the first line of diagnosis. It's really physical exam, x-ray, start treatments, essentially. So treatment, so as I said, they don't usually come in in the beginning. They usually come in when their foot kind of starts to drop a little bit. They think they sprained their ankle, but they can't really figure out why they did it. But really, truly, early diagnosis is the key to prevent the long-term disability. In the early stages, you want to immobilize. You do start them on anti-inflammatories. You rest, and as soon as the pain and swelling starts to go away, you start physical therapy and strengthening. It's also important to maintain um, the arch with an orthotic, and the goal of the orthotic is to immobilize the hind foot to provide stability. 
It will allow um, support to the tendon so it stops kind of becoming inflamed. I typically start with just a simple ankle support with an orthotic. If they don't have a custom orthotic, then we'll use just a prefabricated from the beginning and then move on to a custom orthotic. The bottom left is just an ordinary orthotic. The bottom right is something called a UCBL. When they start to flatten out but not have severe deformity in the beginnings of the stage two, a UCBL is utilized and it controls some of the heel valgus as well as supporting the arch. Most orthotics look like the one on the left. Now when posterior tibial tendon dysfunction advances, it starts giving you the appearance in the upper left corner. <clears throat> and the foot becomes flat and becomes rigid and they lose the inversion power. They are no longer able to go up on their tiptoes and the foot is stiff. It doesn't um, work well with an orthotic because the foot has to be flexible at that point. Usually we move on to bracing in that, in that condition and we use the bottom left, which is an Arizona, or the, the right, which is an AFO. The Arizona is a brace that holds, it's custom molded, it will hold the foot snug so that it doesn't advance in progression of deformity and gives the patient pain relief. It's not the most favorite brace, but by the point that they come uh, with this, it's, it's needed, unfortunately. Then you kind of move on to, you know, what's the next steps? How do I know? Do the person needs, do I need surgery? Do I not need surgery? Surgical indications is really progressive deformity and failure of non-surgical treatment. And the goals of the surgery, ideally you're catching them in stage two so you can keep a supple foot and restore the power and the foot control. You're trying to stop the progression of the flat foot to salvage the joint so they don't go on to develop arthritis. Surgical options in the early um, stages of posterior tibial tendon, the, the procedure is a little complex, um, but simplistically um, said, it's really taking a new tendon and replacing it with the damaged tendon, which is the posterior tibial tendon. We use the tendon that cringes the toes, which is flexor digitorum longus. That tendon is about a third of the size of the posterior tibial tendon, so we can't rely on that alone and used in isolation. So you have to use some bony work to realign and recreate the arch. This is what a flat foot reconstruction will look like, and you cut and shift the bones, realign it to protect your new tendon in place. In the later stages, unfortunately, once it becomes pretty arthritic, you move on to more of a salvage procedure in which you do an arthrodesis or a fusion to the hind foot. You could do a double or a triple arthrodesis, and that realigns the foot so it acts as a foundation. You lose in and out movement, but at, by that point when you're indicating that procedure, the patient really no longer has the in and out movement. You can still move the ankle up and down, and then it relieves the need for a brace. And our final topic is Achilles tendinopathy. <clears throat> so as we had gone through, through for the anatomy for the Achilles tendon, it's a very strong tendon. It acts like a rope. It connects the calf into the heel. There's a watershed area that tends to be pretty vulnerable, as well as at the insertion on the heel. It connects the calf to the heel bone, allows you to point your toes and stand on your tiptoe. So what's tendinopathy? Really, basically, it's just a disease to the tendon. And it can be presented as tendinitis or tendinosis. And the symptoms associated, typically a patient will come in with swelling of their Achilles. It will be either at, within the tendon itself or at the base. Some patients will come, they think they have a mass, um, and they, it's really just part of the tendinitis or, or tendinopathy, meaning that the tendon got scarred. They'll have tenderness and pain with push-off. They'll have morning stiffness because they're tight, and they'll have a limitation in activity. Achilles tendinopathy can be based on um, location, so either insertional or non-insertional. The insertional um, typically is associated with the heel spur called the Haglund's deformity, and the non-insertional is at the watershed area of the Achilles tendon. Can also be classified based on time frame, three weeks, three to six weeks, and greater than six. In tendonitis, they have no thickening or nodularity, and with tendinosis, it's more of a degenerative process, and they have thickening, degener degeneration, and uh, warmth. What causes it? It's typically in runners. Uh, it also can be with other sports and less active individuals. It's the repetitive overload of the tendon and the cumulative microtrauma. 
Major risk factors uh, is usually excessive running, sudden increase in intensity, and decreased recovery between hard workouts. It's usually a change in running surface, so somebody goes from a treadmill to you know, outside running in the spring, they'll have bad shoe wear, they'll have excessive wear on the shoes, they're greater than 35, increased body weight or height, muscle weakness or imbalance, insufficient flexibility, which leads to a significant amount of troubles, and lateral ankle instability. So the best treatment is prevention. You want to develop a sensible training program and increase activity gradually. You want to alternate impact activities and cross train. You want to make sure that you replace your sh shoes that show excessive wear. For runners, it's every three to 500 miles. You want to have a maintenance program of stretching daily before and after activities. Treatment starts uh, is, is somewhat based on how their presentation. So some patients come in, they're limping with every step, they're in a significant flare, they can hardly go near it, it hurts so much. Typically you'll start with a walking boot, anti-inflammatories, and if they can tolerate a little calf stretching, but nothing more than that. If they're just having pain at uh, increased time, so pain in the morning, pain when they go get out of their car, pain on standing, pain after a good workout, you can start with heel lifts. Heel lifts takes the tension of the calf off the Achilles to lessen the irritation there. You start them on anti-inflammatories and night splinting, and you start a program of stretching as soon as they start to have improvement in symptoms. In the recovery phase, as they have improvement in symptoms, then you'll start eccentric Achilles stretching and strengthening. And what they do is they start on their, their um, heels and they rise, and they go up on their toes and they slowly come down. So eccentrics are the, the opposite of doing the fast toe raises, which tighten the calf. That's a concentric exercise. The opposite is the eccentrics in which you slowly lengthen the calf. Not infrequently, somebody will come af in after a change in, in workout, and, and that workout in particular will have a lot of toe raises, and that will also set off the Achilles. So you have to be uh, avoiding that kind of exercise. Cross training is an alternative to impact activities. You stop the running or the jumping activities temporarily until the symptoms improve. Surgery is reserved for recalcitrant Achilles tendinopathy and failure of non-operative treatment for about six months. It ends up being about 25 to 50% of patients with, um, with Achilles tendinopathy. The goal of surgery is to resect the damaged tissue. If it's an insertional, we remove the calcaneal ostectomy. We do a calcaneal ostectomy, which is just removal of the bone spur, and you try to stimulate tendon healing. If greater than 50% of the tendon is damaged, it's augmented with the tendon transfer, which is flexor hallucis longus. It's the tendon that goes to the big toes to bring in a new blood supply for healing. So in conclusion, tips to a pain-free lifestyle, healthy diet, stay active, prevention is the key. There's always surgical and non-surgical options. Thank you. Questions? Sure, sure. So if the patient comes in and they're just really, they're having pain in their heel, you know, it started after they were playing some tennis and they're noticing it first thing in the morning, they're noticing it sometimes when they get out of the car, they'll notice it the next day after they've been doing, you know, had a tennis match or did some exercising or running. You start with heel cups, which is just like a gel silicone insert. It keeps the heel really soft so it doesn't have the pressures. It brings the heel up a little bit takes a little tension of the calf muscle off of the insertion of the plantar fascia. They start anti-inflammatories and icing. And the most important is starting a stretching program. So I typically tell them it's excessive. So essentially, you're going to stretch any time you have pain. So I tell them at least three times a day, they're going to do that plantar fascia stretch and the calf stretch before and after exercise. And they're going to stretch any time that they experience pain. So if they get out of their car, they do the runner stretch. If they're in the shopping mall and they have some heel pain, they're doing a runner stretch, which is just a stretch with the calf. So you could pretty much do that anywhere, and that takes the pressure off of the heel and then starts to improve. Some people go into a big flare, and they could barely walk. Unfortunately, those patients just get put in a boot temporarily, week or two, bring them back, then they can go on to the recovery phase. 